Okay. And now I will uh, like to give uh, <coughs> to let uh, Professor Girish Solanki give his presentation. And uh, he's talking about uh, the different option in uh, pediatric patients. So welcome, Professor Solanki. Hello, Mauricio, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, of course, I would like to thank Professor Zeleni for giving me the opportunity to share the podium on the symposium uh, on Chiari malformations along with greats like Atul Goel and uh, Massimiliano Risochi. So I'm uh, truly honored to be here. Uh, before I start my presentation, while I'm sharing the screen, what I'd like to do is also to pay credit uh, to my predecessors. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, it's okay. Excellent. So I'd like to, first of all, before I start, to say a great thank you to those before me, like Professor Tony Hockley. Uh, and uh, of course, I learned so much from Atul, uh, Mehmet, uh, Massimo, and everybody else that I meet. Because Chiari, as you heard uh, Massimiliano say this, and also Atul, is not simple, is not straightforward, it's not what you see. And also, there are changing concepts, and um, pediatrics in particular, where there is a wide array of different types of uh, Chiari malformations, uh, uh, provides a much bigger tapestry than in adults. And I, I hope for your forgiveness, because I will be introducing topics that may not be very immediately clear, or known, or may even be controversial, and if uh, that happens, then I say sorry in advance. I'm very happy to answer any questions uh, at the end. I'm going to go a little bit fast because gratefully, Massimiliano and Atul have talked about a, a significant number of uh, items in Chiari that I don't particularly have to go into great detail. So some of my slides I will just flash through and I don't want you to be upset about that as well because I don't want to patronize anybody. Now, I work at the Children's Hospital in Birmingham. This is a very old hospital, more than 150 years old, and a lot of great people have worked here with an interest in Chiari malformations. Uh, one particular one uh, was uh, Bernard Williams, uh, who talked about the dissociation, uh, cranial spinal dissociation theory for uh, development of single Miley and Chiari, and many others. Uh, and of course, Tony Hockley, my predecessor, who also developed uh, the initial decompression on the skull for craniosynostosis patients, uh, also worked here. I think everybody will agree that uh, what a Chiari malformation is, as initially described, is that it's a paraxial, paraxial mesodoma insufficiency occurring after the closure of the neural folds takes place. The primary factor in the formation of iron hernia has been, uh, in most instances, a small posterior fossa due to underdeveloped occipital bone. And that's the cases that the Chiari 1 cases that we normally treat. But of course, they are not all of them. And the main objective of surgical treatment is to direct to, that is directed to restore the normal CSF dynamics at the cranial vertebral junction. If you look at the natural history of Chiari, and uh, I have uh, talked about this in the past, uh, I think the largest study going back, uh, sorry, going over a period of three and a half years was about 20 years ago, uh, John Hopkins. And what they did is they looked at 22,591 MRI scans looking for children who had Chiari malformations. And what they found is that uh, 175 children, sorry, 175 patients had Chiari malformations of which about uh, 21 to 25 patients, about 14% of the patients actually had asymptomatic hernias. And this hernia, uh, when asymptomatic, were not associated with either syringomalia or osseous anomalies uh, in these patients. And the average tonsillar hernia was 11 millimeters. So this is what we call the asymptomatic uh, natural history. But when I looked at the study in detail, I found that in this group of patients, only six were children under 18, so of less significance to pediatrics. The relationship uh, that they identified in these patients was that if the hernia increases, then the cisterna magna becomes small. And after 10 millimeters, from 10 to 15, there is a reduction in the cisterna magna. And after 15 millimeters, there is often absence of the cisterna magna. 
So there was a positive uh, correspondence uh, between these two uh, anatomical features. But for us, I think the more important study was that from uh, Professor De Rocco's team in Rome, where they looked at 22 patients and half of those were actually asymptomatic. They were incidental findings of Chiari, but the ones that actually had symptomatic uh, presentations, 22% uh, progressed to clinical worsening. And 14% uh, of this group then progressed to surgery. So clearly there is uh, some progression. And this again, the, the you know, uh, kind of, uh, goes against the definition of a malformation because malformations, congenital malformations don't progress. If you are born with something which is congenital, you have it and you have to treat it. But congenital malformations don't progress to get worse. So we decided to look at this. And of course, 20 something years ago when I started pediatric neurosurgery, I was ignorant in most aspects of care in hindbrain hernia, uh, PI malformations. Uh, and I started looking at the literature, I started doing my own studies to try to understand this better. And what I discovered is that the presentations that already exist uh, were short follow-ups, uh, two and a half to three years. In those patients, progression is very small, less than 10% progression. And there was, some, uh, there was no evidence of regression. And then later, in the last sort of 10 years, uh, two large studies, um, the Professor De Rocco study in 2008 and our current study, uh, uh, which we presented in 2013, demonstrated a much larger progression and also some regression because our follow-up was longer. So it was more than five years. And in these uh, patients, there is definitely greater progression between 10 to 14%, but there is also 3 to 5% regression, spontaneous regression of the Chiari. So the literature uh, kind of tells us that if you are treating Chiari malformations, you have to follow them for at least five years to know where they're going. Not all of them require immediate surgery, but there is a rapid deterioration in these patients, which occurs within the first two years in those that usually have either CSF pro flow problem, ventriculomegaly, or some skull base anomaly. So what is the pattern of progression and severity in a Chiari 1 in children? What is the fate of a Chiari, first of all? We found that out. Some are symptomatic, 3 to 5 regress, 9 to 14% will progress, and the vast majority will remain stable. Do they progress equally? Of course not. The simple Chiaris uh, without ventricular megaly, cranial synostosis, ESF signal loss, they will progress slowly. But the complex carries, uh, those are the ones that are expected to progress rapidly and will end up requiring surgery. And in fact, uh, there is multiple publication literature that uh, associate hernia uh, with single myelita uh, between 30 to 75 percent of the cases. Uh, and what is the mechanism of progression? Well, a lot of theories, because this is not very well understood how a hindbrain hernia, for example, will develop a syrinx or a scoliosis. Uh, the commonest and most well accepted will be Bernard Williams' postulation of a craniosplanal pressure dissociation or Gardner's suggested CSI pulsation as pathological drive to progression of fine brain hernia and syringomyelia. And when does it become a surgical problem? When do uh, neurosurgeons will, cons uh, will consider treating a PRE? So in pediatrics, uh, a huge survey of the uh, International Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery carried out like, some 20 years ago, uh, identified most neurosurgeons, pediatric neurosurgeons, will consider a tonsillar descent of 12 millimeters with loss of CSF at the cranial cervical junction uh, as, uh, and of course, appearance of a syrinx as parameters to consider surgery. Can any Chiari be treated by a foramen magnum decompression? And I think that's an interesting question because the gold standard for treatment has been uh, the performance of a foramen magnum decompression. I have put this slide up because I thought that uh, Professor uh, Massimiliano did a very uh, good job in identifying what the consensus amongst neurosurgeons is in terms of how do you go about managing Chiari 
so on. So thank you for, uh, I've borrowed the slide from your presentation. I think this is quite helpful. But the important thing here is, do you do form and magnum decompression for everybody? And I think the answer is no. And you heard Professor Goel talk about the cervical instability requiring a different approach in patients with Chiari. And I'll also tell you that patients with uh, craniocephalic mismatch, such as in craniosynostosis or with deformation of the back of the skull, they will also require different treatments. So the first thing I will say is that along with Massimiliano and uh, Professor Goel, I would also say that Chiari malformation is a term that should be discontinued and should be called deformation. Deformation of the cerebellar tonsils, not malformation, because malformation implies that the child was born with a hind brain hernia from birth, and we know this is not true. We know that this progresses over a period of five years or 10 years, and therefore it can't be a malformation, it is a deformation. And uh, evidence coming out from a fetal surgery in myelomeningocele has also shown that even Chiari II, which was considered a different entity, is also a mechanical progressive herniation. And if you operate on a child and repair the myelomeningo seal before birth, the hindbrain hernia uh, regresses in nearly 100% of the cases. So we know that these are progressive mechanical uh, def deformations of the, of the cerebellar tonsils because something is pushing it down or there is a leak down which is sucking uh, or creating a sump effect, which is dragging uh, the posterior fossa uh, CNS downwards into the spine. So we call that supertentorial crowding. Uh, and what that means is that there is a pressure coming from above the tent, pushing down onto a very small posterior fossa and uh, dragging the contents of the posterior fossa into the foramen magnum. And that will be very much part of what I will intend to talk um, uh, at this uh, presentation. So there are, and it's just not just one item, but you all know that Chiari malformations, as we call them, so I prefer to call them hindbrain hernias. So you all know that hindbrain hernias are associated with ventricular megaly, cranial synostosis, basal invagination, cranial cervical instability, scoliosis. These are very well recognized now. Of course, not all of them will have all of these features, but there is, these are the known associations. And interestingly, these are also very much the same associations for syringomyelia. In addition to that, of course, syringomyelia can also be associated with tethered cord, lipomas, split cord malformations. That means that there is something down, pulling the spinal cord downwards and causing this function of the spinal cord and formation of a syrinx. So ventricular megaly, first of all. So how does ventricular megaly uh, uh, how is ventricular megaly associated with the Chiari? Does ventricular megaly cause the Chiari? And there is some evidence that the uh, presence of uh, in, in, uh, pressure within the ventricles causes increased downward push, like a piston drive effect, uh, pushing the tentorial, the tentorial cerebelli and the cerebellum downwards. And of course, this then will obliterate the CSF fluid between cervical junction with loss of buoyancy and further descent of the tonsils and impaction. So that could be one mechanism uh, for worsening of uh, Chiari and Syrinx. But it could also be said that as the Chiari blocks the foramen of uh, Monroe and Lushka and uh, stops CSF flowing at the, uh, at the current cervical junction, that that in itself uh, could then cause the ventricular megaly above it. So there is, of course, two possibilities here. And I think in the end, both mechanisms play a role in development of the um, hindbrain hernia. Now, of course, don't take my word for it, but there's multiple publications now coming out from Professor De Rocco's team, from my good friend, Colin Malucci in Liverpool. And all of this are indicating that if you just do an ETV for a patient with ventricular megaly and Chiari, 94% will remain shunt free and 83% with the syrinx will show improvement and resolution of the syrinx following the ETV. So this is a minimal procedure for which uh, there is a resultant improvement, not only in the hindbrain hernia regression, but also deflation of the syrinx. Uh, there's a large study coming out of China as well, 
showing an 80% success rate. So as we move forward, uh, there is more and more treatments that are coming, which are resulting in improvement in both the hindbrain hernia and the syrinx. So we ourselves did a study in our hospital looking at the effects of uh, ETV. And uh, when we looked at all of our patients that are undergone ETVs, identified those that had a Chiari, spina, uh, sorry, Chiari uh, and syringomyelia, we found uh, at the time that I, we presented this study, there were only 139 ETVs and uh, 10 patients. But the number of those patients now has increased to 12. And uh, what we found is that these patients had a 90% success rate in deflation of the syrinx and regression of the Chiari by a simple ETV. And there were a number of associated conditions with it, but you can see that isolated Chiari uh, was uh, one of the significant um, uh, set, set of patients that we had uh, uh, done ETV on, more than 50%. Okay, so this is ventricular megaly. Then move on to syringomyelia. So what are the factors associated uh, you know, uh, with syringomyelia when you have a hindbrain hernia? Again, there's lots of uh, theories, poorly understood. I talked about this. Uh, 30 to 75% of Chiaris can have a syrinx. Uh, but what we started finding is there are some very specific radiological features uh, that seem to be associated with the syrinx in children. And not only that, we then did a wider study looking at uh, not just the radiological, of course, this is very well known to you, and you can see what happens here, the CSF flow at cranial cervical junction, and then what happens? There is compaction of the small posterior force, so the angle of the tent drops down, uh, everything gets blocked, and no uh, CSF will no longer move, and then a syrinx will develop. So, and Menezes, nearly 30 years ago, reminded us that patients who develop syringomyelia with the hindbrain hernia often have skull base anomalies, up to 50%. So again, you know, this is what Professor Goel has been telling us, that this is a significant group of patients with the Chiari and syringomyelia, and the cranial cervical junction anomalies need attention and treatment. So... What are these things? So what we found is that in our series uh, with uh, syringomyelia and hindbrain hernia, uh, craniocephalic mismatch was prominent. We had cranial cervical compression, cranial, uh, cranial spinal pressure differential, and also some cases with restriction of spinal cord ascent, uh, either by tethered cord, lipomas, and so on. So a number of factors associated with syringomyelia. And when we did our review, uh, we found a number of um, anatomical angles in the posterior fossa, which were predictive of development of a syrinx when a Chiari occurs. The most important one really was the loss of CSF signal at the foramen magnum, uh, which was significantly associated with syringomyelia. Now, a lot of these measurements are not done uh, in a clinical setting because it does take some time to do them, even though they're quite useful it would require radiologists to measure them. But what is helpful, for example, are the clinical variables. And our statistician uh, very clearly identified that a child who is as 100 months of age, that is eight years and four months, has a tonsillar hernia more than 12 millimeters, has a sagittal diameter of the foramen magnum um, ratio with the posterior fossa height more than 0 0.6, and the ratio of the clival angle to the foramen magnum magnum clival angle of less than 0 0.8 is highly predictive for development of syrinx. And this is a very strong uh, correlation of variables using a principal component analysis uh, for prediction of uh, syrinx. So we know that some patients will progress and we also know that which patients will then end up getting a syrinx. And then we started putting together all this knowledge that we were acquiring. So we knew that Chiari and Syrinx formation were associated with a small posterior fossa. And our experience with patients with cranial synostosis told us that those patients are more likely to develop what we call supratentorial crowding. And that will then push the small posterior fossa contents down into the spine, leading to obstruction of the foramen magnum, and then subsequent development of the Syrinx. And clearly, 
to all of you, if you see a patient who has got such severe uh, raised intracranial pressure uh, with um, the copper, copper, copper beaten appearance, with this honeycomb appearance, uh, then it will be very uh, easy for you to understand uh, that in a deformed skull, uh, a typical craniocephalic mismatch like in Klebat shadow deformity, that this child, of course, will get a hindbrain hernia and that will then result in a syrinx. So that concept, I think, is very easily understood. So what if there is less of a compression? And this is uh, cases, for example, if you look at the one in the middle here, you can see the flattening of the back of the head there, same thing there. And the thing that you see is that the contents above the tentorium, which is occipital low, are actually now lying behind the cerebellum. And the cerebellum has been pushed forward. And you can see a worse situation here with herniation of the hindbrain hernia on the image on the right hand side. Okay, so you can see the CSF around, hardly any CSF and less CSF. So again, it goes back to the features we identified, uh, which we call supertentorial crowding, which is a steep angle of the tent, a flattening of the occipital bone, uh, venous engorgement, cervical medullary kink, standing up cerebellum, occipital lobe posterior to the cerebellum. So the, all of these features are very typical. When you look at an MRI like that, you know that this patient has got craniocephalic mismatch. The brain is smaller than the skull volume. Some of it is going to herniate. And a lot of it has to do with skull-based anomalies, as I will explain later. Now look at this. Uh, if I make a graphic uh, uh, the pictorial demonstration of what is happening, you can see that the line that goes from the posterior clinoid to the inion contains about one third of the cerebellum above it. But if you look at the ones with the hindbrain hernia, most of the cerebellum is below that line. And not only that, on the first, on the picture on the left hand side, the occipital lobe is above the line. On the others, the picture now is well below the line, as you can see here. So there is a reduction in the posterior fossa volume because of supertentorial crowding of supertentorial structures, which are now lying in a diminutive posterior fossa. And only one thing can happen is that you won't get a hernia. Uh, and the hernia, of course, will then start progressively compressing on the brainstem and create what we call the foramen magnum compression syndrome with uh, vertical oscillopsia, corneal nerve palsy, swallowing difficulties, and so on and so forth. So this progressive tonsillar hernia, and what it does is that it further reduces the posterior fossa volume, causes angular change of the skull base, including the development of platybasia, uh, because a lot of these patients have actually a failure of the occipital somite. So the proatlas is diminutive, and the, the, the clivus, instead of being elongated, is short and stubby. So you lose a few millimeters of the base of the skull because the tip of the, the lowermost tip of the clivus actually incorporates in the odontoid tip, which becomes dolichoid. So the size of the posterior fossa is affected by a skull base anomaly and becomes smaller. And of course, all of this will lead to other things. Now, what we discovered when looking at the foramen magnum is that in Chiari 1 and Chiari 2, the foramen magnum sagittal and transverse diameters, as well as the surface area, are bigger, are larger in Chiari 1 and Chiari 2. And Professor Goel also noted that in a number of his patients, you have adequate CSF in the cisternal magna, and the posterior fossa doesn't uh, look too compressed at the foramen magnum. So we have found the same thing, that a lot of these patients actually have a very large foramen magnum. Even though the posterior fossa may be small, the foramen magnum is wide open because the herniation may have already occurred before the ossification of the um, posterior, the, uh, the uh, opistian. So this, you know, this was the next step in our evolution in terms of knowledge that now we have supertentorial explanation, a posterior force explanation, form and magnum explanation, and then finally we got to the spinal explanation. Uh, and what we essentially are saying is that Chiari 1 and Chiari 2 are hernias. They are not malformations, they are hernias. And those hernias require 
an increase in the intracranial contents, a small relative cranium, and the presence of an incompetent hernial orifice for a uh, myelia then to happen, uh, which is the effect of essentially what we'd call a strangulated hernia. Now, uh, a few years ago, I was very kindly invited by Professor Goel to give a talk on cranial vertebral malformations in children during the International Congress uh, held in Rio de Janeiro on cranial vertebral junction. And what I talked about was my very early experience in pediatrics on what of the skull-based anomalies are associated with Chiara and Syringomyelia. And uh, again, uh, I would mention this just in passing because Professor Goel has already talked a lot about this. Occipitosomite 4 is what we're looking at. It leads to the development of proaculus and all of the skull-based anomalies that we are interested in come from the proaculus. Okay, so this is essentially what you need to remember. And then uh, the atlas assimilation is the commonest abnormality that you'd find and the type 3 is the one that you most likely you're going to be operating on. Type 1 of course is just the fusion of the anterior arch of C1 to the clivus. Type 2 is also the presence of a posterior C2, C3 laminar fusion uh, and type 3 is when there is an association uh, of instability with this. Now, if you think about atlanto axial instability, group one is what I just told you, is the type three atlanto axial instability. Uh, sorry, uh, the type three uh, assimilation of atlas. Group two is there's no atlas assimilation, but there is odontoid hypoplasia or maldevelopment, which you often see in things like Down syndrome and other cases like mucopolysaccharidosis and so on. And uh, group three is when there is neither odontoid hypoplasia or maldevelopment, no atlas assimilation, but there is rotatory subluxation or a degree of central instability, which you cannot very easily identify. So all of these aspects of atlanto axial instability need to be taken into consideration when you plan treatment for Chiara and Syringomyelia. You know very much what atlanto axial instability is. I'm not going to spend too much time with this. But what I wanted to show you is that you need to consider the various types of instability. Horizontal, vertical, particularly for us, rotatory, okay? So when you look at uh, this, you have to think of, although we look at two-dimensional images, the instability is actually a three-dimensional process. And I always, I'm always reminded about what Professor Goel said, that atlanto axial dislocation instability is the primary cause of all types of basal invagination. And I would agree with that. And I want to show you what we have discovered in, in, in our patients about what happens during basal invagination. Here's a normal appearance uh, with normal anterior atlanto dense, posterior atlanto dense measurements. But then as time goes by, as the horizontal instability happens, the atlanto dense, anterior atlanto dense interval increases. And finally, what happens is the head, the weight of the head starts sending the C1 arch down onto C2. And when that happens, you would have to ask the question, how does a lateral mass of C2 uh, slide upwards against the lateral mass of C1? And if you think of this, look at this picture here, that's C2 and that's C1, that's the joint. So how do you get basal invagination where C2 goes up? The only way this can happen is when there is a widening of the lateral masses of C1, hypoplasia of the lateral masses of C1, or rotation of the lateral mass of C1, such that it will allow the lateral masses of C2 to slide upwards. Okay, so if you, if you look again pictorially, this is the normal appearance. This is now the widening of the C1 lateral masses. They start falling sideways. And you can see now that there is an angulation of the C1, C2 joint. That's becoming more obtuse, nearly vertical. When that happens, C2 can slide inside of C1. Okay, and this is when it completely slides. At this point, there is now compaction of the C0, C1 joint. The C1, C2 joints become nearly vertical. 
and the dents will now be lying either just below the Froman magnum or through it. And uh, this is a picture that shows you the situation, a sagittal view. You can see this is the lateral mass of C1, but actually the lateral mass of C2, which should have been down here, is lying behind and above. And Professor Goel showed a lot of these images today. I could clearly see what was going on there. And of course, this is the pathophysiological progression of these patients from group B to group A, and the facet instability that occurs with them uh, where not only uh, these patients uh, will show either anterior facetal instability or posterior facetal instability, but may have uh, uh, central instability, and that uh, will cause significant cord compression from the front or from behind, particularly if there is a syrinx and a carry present as well. Uh, this is a particular case that we had a child that presented with snoring and all the other features. You can see the Chiari in the back, the very significant uh, herniation, um, um, type A uh, ba uh, basilar invagination. Um, this is the CT scan showing the nearly vertical facet joints that start occurring in these patients as C2 slides through the middle. You see the widening of the C1 lateral masses. So C2 slips up between the widening of the C1 lateral masses and there is a vertical arrangement of the C1, C2 joint that allows the slipping inside. Uh, so instead of calling it medial uh, facetal instability, sorry, instead of calling it central, we could call it a medial facetal instability because it's going through the midline. And again, you can see how this is now a vertical joint when the joint should have been horizontal and that would have prevented uh, the uh, platybasia, sorry, the uh, basilar invagination. Again, more pictures. So I operated on this patient and I did what Professor Goel has been recommending to distract C2 from C1, to um, open the C1, C2 joint, jam the C2, C1, C2 joint with bone graft. And uh, this is the pre and post-op appearance. You can see here, uh, the C1 was completely true, sorry, C2 was completely true, the foramen magnum. And this is after distraction, joint jamming and C1, C2 fixation. Uh, is a child with uh, a simulation of atlas, as you can see. So this is pre-op appearance on the left and uh, right hand side, with the post-op appearance on the left hand side, a significant improvement uh, with regression of the uh, initial features, and the child is much improved with improving myelopathy. So uh, this is definitely something that I have included in my armamentarium for treatment of Chiari malformation, uh, and to me now. The mechanism in pediatrics for Chiari and Syringa Miley is more obvious, and it includes, in the first instance, at the very top, ventricular megaly causing raised intracranial pressure, supratentorial crowding, craniocephalic mismatch. Then if you look at cranial synostosis patients, they have got a craniocephalic mismatch, and that would lead to formation of a hindbrain hernia through herniation. And finally, basilar invagination, cranial cervical junction anomalies, small posterior fossa, cranial cephalic mismatch. All of these will create a downward push, stretching, Chiari, and final pathway, swing a myelia. On the other side, if you have children who have got tethered cord, that can cause a caudal pull without a Chiari and lead to swing a myelia. So this was our identification of the multiple pathologies involved in Chiari and Syringomyelia, and we decided therefore to start looking at changing concepts. Uh, they were already beginning to appear. We of course changed our concept way back in 2003, but others started operating and saying, well, you know, if you, for example, have craniocephalic mismatch, don't bother to affirm in magnum decompression, uh, just treatment for the cranial synostosis will reverse the Chiari. Uh, larger paper coming out from uh, Finland uh, supported our posterior cranial vault distraction surgery with similar results. Another one from um, Paris uh, suggesting that posterior cranial vault distraction is an efficacious technique to enlarge the posterior skull vault. Uh, and a number of other papers, uh, and, uh, you, you'll find them in the literature. So the idea really is that we should consider something that does not require us to open the dura uh, because we know that opening the dura is the biggest problem. At, at, 
you heard from Massimiliano in adults, firm and magnum decompression uh, by using a variety of techniques, and Professor Goel alluded to this as well, is the standard gold, uh, gold standard treatment for treatment of uh, Chiari. But I put to you at, that you now have heard what happens in children and the various other alternative treatments. And I want you to consider also the problems of form and micron decompression. If you do a too extensive resection, you get further herniation. If you open the dura, then you get the complications of uh, CSF leak. And uh, a number of people have now reported the recurrence rate. Uh, and Massimiliano showed a nice uh, a slide talking about the recurrence in um, Chiari surgery. Uh, which can be nearly between 25 to 50 percent. Uh, Claire Clamp also talked about uh, what happens uh, in these patients. My colleagues in Oxford talked about problems after Chiari 1 malformation, including recurrent subdural hygromas. Uh, uh, my colleagues in Liverpool uh, reported that they had, uh, following a simple Chiari 1 form and magnum decompression, that they developed these children at the chance of developing iatrogenic hydrocephalus. Uh, and a similar study from uh, Ireland also indicated that form and magnum decompression is not to be underestimated, that they not only had increasing incidence of hydrocephalus in 18.5% of the patients, but also significant mortality and morbidity. So for this reason, we started doing posterior carveal augmentation, which is expansion of the skull to increase the supratentorial volume without opening the dura. Uh, the procedure uh, is based on a simple fact that these patients have a small back of the head, small posterior fossa, small flattening of the back, and if they don't have to be craniofacial patients. Chiari 1 patients have very similar appearances on the MRI scan. And the intention is that we expand the back of the head. And by doing that, uh, we create the space available for the brain to expand into a normal uh, uh, intracranial volume, thereby relieving the uh, herniation in the foramen magnum and allowing CSF flow, which will then lead to um, uh, deflation of the syrinx. Here is an example. This is a raised intracranial pressure before decompression. You can see the diploic veins, collateral circulation. After we do a posterior carvarial release, the pressure goes down, and that creates the space. Uh, initially, we only did a posterior release up to 2003. Since then, we've been uh, doing augmentations and distractions. I'm going to go quickly on this because it's not as important what we do, but it's important why we do it. This is the surgical technique. I'm just passing through. I've shown this in the past. Uh, it's opening the posterior calvarial space and then fixing it with plates. Uh, we now have, uh, as I mentioned in my previous uh, talks, uh, nearly 40 patients with this technique, but we have another 75 patients with using distraction. So we've crossed the 100 number uh, with no, no mortality, very little morbidity, and most of these patients have regression of their hand brain hernia and syrinx. So I'm just gonna jump these pictures now. Uh, I think you've seen the technique, it's been published. Uh, it, the distraction requires basically pulling the skull back like that over a period of time. Uh, and you can see what happens. A flat back becomes a normal back. And it's this change in shape that results in more space for the hindbrain hernia to uh, regress. Uh, this is the results of um, the 75% so of the patients that had distraction where the syrinx uh, had the regression of the syrinx uh, or deflation of the syrinx. Finally, I just wanted to tell you, tell you about the last uh, technique that we use, which is patients who have either lipomas, have a tethered cord and a hollow cord syrinx. When we do a resection of the lipoma or treatment of a neural tube defect, what we identified is that these patients also have a deflation of their syrinxes or regression of the hindbrain hernia. So this is what we call the caudal pool uh, that results in um, improvement in their syrinx as well. 
So just to finalize now, what I want to tell you is again to remind you that Chiari 1 and Chiari 2 are not malformations, they are hernias. The tonsils are deformed, not malformed, and is due to an increase in intracranial contents or a smaller relative cranium in the presence of incompetent hernia orifice. And single myelin is the effect of hernia strangulation. You saw the algorithm of how it happens. Now, if we turn it around, then we can say that if you have ventricular megaly, an ETV, and monitor. If you have a Chiari with cranial synostosis, that means cranial mismatch, dual posterior calvarial augmentation. If you have scoliosis requiring correction, do a calvarial augmentation first, and often the scoliosis recovers and does not require a, a long segment fixation. If you have basilar invagination or cranial cervical junction anomalies, then consider a C1, C2 fixation. If that fails, <coughs> then you can do something else. And finally, if you have a, uh, uh, a isolated, uh, some form of uh, distal tethered cord, this also can improve by surgery on them. And I just wanted to bring to your attention that patients who have had foramen magnum decompression and have then failed with further progression of the syrinx were offered posterior cover augmentation with improvements. So here's an example of a patient who had two uh, procedures of form and magnum decompression with resection of the tonsils uh, and the patient continued to deteriorate and develop the holocaust series. Uh, after uh, failing on two attempts and demonstrating uh, adequate cisterna magna, ad adequate flow at the cranial cervical junction, we carried out, a, this is after the second operation, we carried out a, a posterior calvary augmentation. And soon as we carried out the posterior calvary augmentation, within three months, the syrinx deflated and the uh, hindbrain hernia, the CSF of the cranial cervical junction improved. So I'm going to conclude now by saying that hindbrain hernias should not be called Chiari malformations anymore. They are deformations of the cerebellar tonsils. They are usually caused, particularly in children, by supratentorial crowding but they also can be associated with ventricular megaly, which can be treated by simple ETV in the first instance. The small posterior fossa is often associated in nearly 50% of the cases by skull-based anomalies, and those require treatment first before anything else. The syringomyelia can be caused by the, what we call the blockage of the foramen magnum or a caudal traction of the spinal cord. And this is, a summary of what I've just told you, that this is how we treat our patients. If they have ventricular megaly, we would first treat by ETV. Uh, if they have cranial mismatch, we treat by post uh, posterior calvary augmentation. If they have instability, we carry out a fixation first or distraction of the invagination. And we don't treat the syrinx directly, we treat the Chiari and uh, that usually results in improvement. So I'm going to stop here and uh, allow time for questions. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't know if Mehmet came back, but uh, I want to thank you for your fantastic presentation. And uh, my comment is that uh, after Goel presentation, we had only a single father. Now, now we have two fathers because <laughs> when we are talking about uh, body or imagination, you do completely agree with Goel. But uh, you introduced a different concept beside uh, the concept by Goyle, which was uh, inst just instability, so as it was instability, which is supratentorial crowding plus small aperture fossa plus uh, um, some craniocephalic mismatch. So you have two different theories in some way. They can meet somewhere, but by one side, we are looking at the uh, karma formation or deformation as a problem which rides from C1, C2. By the other side, we look at this problem from the top, uh, from something which is crowding and uh, increasing the pressure on top of the posterior fossa. I don't want to make any comment about it, but I will ask you to Massimiliano to give his comment to and uh, possibly suggestion to how we can really 
uh, unify these two different theories and to also to the other speakers. Massimiliano, can you hear me? Ah, uh, unfortunately, Mr. we... Massimiliano, please. Okay. Okay, I, I... Sorry. sorry. Okay. Thank you, Maurizio, for your beautiful question. Uh, I think that uh, partially I try to answer this question. No, the... it's a difficult question, of course. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, in, in the first part of this uh, uh, webinar, I th think that the goal to uh, introduce the concept of fathership and also your comment about two different fathers, the same of mine of uh, some minutes ago. Many children, many features, many uh, clinical and neuroradiological patterns for different etiologies. Number one, to identify etiology. Number two, to tailor therapy. No doubt at all that uh, the Goel uh, philosophy is effective for those kinds of uh, uh, Chiari and Schering's association uh, with the uh, one. Uh, Massimiliano, yes. we are completely out of time. So try to be short. I'm sorry. To interrupt you uh, because I would like also to have a comment from uh, both uh, Girish yes. and Goyle if and, it's still there. Actually, okay, try to be yes. short. Many and, people uh, are I agree okay. also with Girish who identify different etiology for a similar to identify the right thanks a lot uh go on are yeah. you still there yes yes <clears throat> your comments no comments no comments wonderful presentations i enjoy from both my friends Girish and from Massimiliano. As you know, this subject of Chiari malformation is quite a complex subject. And it has various kinds of, uh, you know, discussion. And there is this discussion. You have to actually do it to, first of all, don't just poo poo things. Uh, as Professor Goyle says, some things are difficult. You have to do it, then you make your own mind about these things. And uh, I learned the technique of Professor Goyle only five years ago. I've been doing it for a while, but I. I could say that I'm confident in doing it only in the last five years. And in those five years, we have done, we have unified the children that would be suitable for the surgery. And we have done now six cases of children with Chiari and using the Goel approach. Of the six children, one has failed, and it's probably because of my surgical technique. Uh, and that child is now gone for posterior calvarial augmentation. But the others are stable or have got better. So I know that there is validity in what Professor Goel has demonstrated in uh, pediatrics as well. And I'm very keen to see the long-term results on that. And uh, with the other things, uh, it's, a, it's a, a collaborative effort around the world. So none of that is my discovery. So the ETV in uh, ventricular megaly is being done by everybody around the world now in pediatrics, very simple operation, and it resolves. Posterior recovery augmentation, we started it in 2003. We've got now 15, 16 years of experience uh, and more than 100 cases. It's safe. Okay, 
So uh, I think that great, we're getting close now. I want to thank everybody and the speaker for being really fantastic. And it works fantastic. for those patients with chronic cephalic mismatch. Okay. Thank you. It was thank great you very much to everybody. It has been really fantastic webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you to everybody. Thank, thank everybody for participating this uh, this nice. Webinar. Ah, okay. See you.